Good morning, congregation. Good to see all of you all again. Have you ever had the experiences of trying to share the gospel to someone only to be faced with rejection or indifference or to be politely ignored or looking at things at the opposite angle? Have you ever had people question your faith asking if what you believe was true? Now what if all your life you have been living in a lie and placing your hope on what is false? And um, maybe on a personal level, perhaps you have doubts about your own faith. You may have asked, what if somewhere along my Christian journey, something really, really bad happened to me? I abandoned my faith in God. Now what if I sin big time? Will I lose my salvation? Or if you are non-Christian, you may be asking, what is all this fuss about Jesus? Who is this person? What can he really do for me? Or you may consider yourself a Christian and sitting here right now and uh, you are attending church regularly, you like this environment, you treasure your friendships, you have, you are here, your, your parents are here, your children are here. So this community of people is very important to you. But have you considered the most important person in this church, Jesus? Have you understood who he is? And what does having a relationship with him means? So many questions, right? Today's passage, in some sense, addresses all of these questions. It started with a question as well. So before I begin, let us have a word of prayer. Father, I pray that your spirit will bring the truth about Jesus into our hearts this morning. Grant me clarity of speech, use your words to accomplish your purpose. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus was in the temple of Jerusalem one day and he was confronted by the Jews with the question, if you are the Christ, please tell us plainly. Now this triggered off a series of startling answers and explanations, evoking a very violent response from the Jews, almost causing them to want to kill Jesus. It didn't happen though and ended with a gentle invitation from Jesus on why and how they can believe in Him. I'd like to summarize today's outline as asking and yet unbelieving with the Jews asking Jesus a question uh, and yet refusing to believe and then with Jesus giving them surprising unbelievable answers and after hearing the answers the Jews wanted to stone Jesus for blasphemy Jesus reasoned with them and gave them a very reasonable answer and ended with a gentle invitation to believe. Now, two weeks ago, in chapter 9, we learned that Jesus killed a man born blind who, after a third of events, came to faith in Jesus. In the middle of all this, the Pharisees were very unhappy. They were upset that not only had Jesus broken the Sabbath, but that he had performed a miracle they couldn't prove was a hoax. Now instead of rejoicing over the fact that a good work from God had been done, after all a blind man, one of their very own, was made to see again, their reaction was one of violence. They cursed this man who had been killed and cast him out of the community. And afterward Jesus pronounced the religious leaders as spiritually blind and unfit to be the shepherds of the people. Now, in the first part of chapter 10, preached last week by our elder Jonas, Jesus also used figures of speech with them. He declared himself as the door of the sheep, and all who enter through that door will be saved. He also spoke of himself as a good shepherd, leading the sheep to good pastures, laying down his life for them, and taking up again. The image of the sheep and shepherd continue in today's passage. In this second part of chapter 10, we see Jesus appearing in the temple in winter at the Feast of Dedication. And he was in the part of the temple known as the Solomon's Colonnade. And the Jews gathered around him to ask him the question, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us clearly. Now, you may be wondering, why, why, is this, why are the Jews asking such a question? 
seems like uh, this is not the first time that they are asking him this question. What is motivating them? Were Jesus not clear enough with them? There are some possibilities over here. Firstly, they could be asking because Jesus had often used figures of speech with them and they still couldn't get it. They still could not make sense of what Jesus is trying to say. Secondly, they could have at the surface understood what Jesus was trying to say. But what Jesus was saying and what Jesus was doing is threatening their self-interest, especially the religious teachers and leaders. So they are trying to look for an opportunity to catch him to say something wrong, to bring charges against him and then to arrest him. Now, thirdly, when they are asking about the Christ, by the way, the meaning of the word Christ means the anointed one, the saviour of the Messiah. They are asking about the one predicted to come by the prophets. Now throughout the Old Testament prophecies, the Christ and the Messiah has always been linked to a person who will restore Israel as a nation to full glory. Some of these Jews possibly could have longed for Jesus to be this powerful leader that could lead them and free them from the Romans. Now, whatever the reasons, they want Jesus to give them an answer, but an answer they want to hear. Are they really interested in the truth? Not quite really. Most of them had an agenda and a motive in their hearts. They want Jesus to fulfill it. Just like sometimes, right, when our friends or others ask us a question, right, we sense there's a hidden agenda. Example, when I'm in my running gear and about to leave the house for a job, my helper Virgin sometimes will ask, are you going for a job? I say, yeah, isn't it obvious? <laughs> then they say, then she ask, are you going to the gym or are you going outside? Ah, then it dawned upon me that the real purpose of the question was for me that if I'm going jogging outside to pick up some grocery. <laughs> so, we are confronted with many questions like this in our daily lives. The questions are asked uh, with a hidden intent and with the mind made up already decided on a certain issue. And But on a more serious note, isn't this true of many of us with regards to the truth of the Gospel? When presented with the Gospel and the person of Jesus, we want Jesus to fit into an idea of who we should be. When confronted with the truth of the Bible, the non-believers or even some of us believers want the truth to satisfy an agenda in our hearts. We are unable to hear God's truth, we are unable to hear God's voice because the postures of our heart are wrong. If the Jews or even us expect Jesus to answer in the way they want, they are going to be very disappointed. And this brings us to the first principle. Jesus will not answer as per what we want to hear, but what we need to hear. Many in this modern world would like to think of Jesus as a good moral teacher, teaches people to do good. He's not different from any of the historical religious figures. Some say that he's a prophet, and only a prophet. Nothing more than that. Something of Jesus as a fictional character created by men to support a theory of philosophy. Some may acknowledge him as God, but they have a very unbalanced view. They only want him to be a God that is gracious, that is loving, but not a God who hates sin and judge people. This list can go on and on. Now let's stop for a moment and think about how we approach or even presents God's truth and the Gospel. Do we interpret or present them with an internal agenda of our own or in the face of popular opinions or public pressure, do we only give them what they want to hear but not what they need to hear? There was this uncle of a young girl, a sister in Christ whom I knew many many years ago. She was uh, suffering from a terminal illness and towards the end stage, she was in a great amount of pain and suffering. This uncle of hers was a non-believer but loved her dearly. During her knees last days, he encountered several of her 
niece, Christian friends, church members, and pastor who are trying to minister to her and to uh, comfort to the niece. And uh, at the same time, they also try to talk to the uncle about Jesus and the Christian faith. But the uncle made one statement. He told us, unless God heal my niece, take this pain and suffering from her, I will never believe in Jesus. Now, this sister in Christ passed away eventually. When I met up with this uncle quite a while ago, he was not yet a believer. God I pray that one day he will see the truth. But for this uncle, he was unable to believe as his heart wanted a God who can heal her niece immediately and deliver her from pain and suffering in this life. And sometimes, churches try to present the Christian faith in a way that is pleasing to the eyes and ears. Many popular ch churches preach that the belief in Jesus will bring about prosperity. Now, this is of course pleasing to the ears and looks attractive. But what if the health and the wealth does not happen? The so-called faith of the individual is in doubt. Thus, the truth of the gospel in the face of popular opinion, sadly speaking, is never communicated clearly. But we shall see how Jesus gave the Jews what they needed to hear in five verses from 25 to 30. In short, the answer that Jesus is giving them is, if I may express it this way, he say, yes, you are asking me if I am the Christ, right? I am the Christ and I am much more than that. I am equal to God the Father. I am also going to tell you that what is wrong with you and what you can do about it. Listen to me carefully because if you don't, your eternal destiny is at stake. I'd like to summarize Jesus' answer in four pairs of two, for easy remembrance, in four pairs of two. The answer that Jesus gave them consists of two pieces of evidences. It's addressed to two groups of people and contains two aspects of salvation and two truths about his identity. In verse 25, Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. Jesus said that the evidences has always been there. I told you, meaning on numerous occasions, Jesus had revealed who he is. He had spoken, though he had often been using figures of speech, but he had spoken and they were not paying attention or they were not interested, or they think that his claims were too outrageous. But Jesus' teaching were powerful, full of wisdom, and nobody spoke like him. Although Jesus' teaching seemed to be radical, but it is always consistent with their scripture, the Old Testament. And for the works of Jesus, namely, it means the miracles, these speak for themselves. Jesus had made high claims, no doubt, Okay? But these claims are often backed up with good works and miracles. In fact, if they had bothered to examine the works of Jesus against the Old Testament, they would have concluded that He is the Christ, the Messiah that is being spoken of. Now, next we see that Jesus began to divide is here into two groups of people, those who do not believe and those who believe. For those who do not believe, despite clear evidences of Jesus' words and work, those who do not believe do not because they are not his sheep, meaning their hearts are hardened. And for those who believe, Jesus described them as his sheep. The sheep are given by God the Father and Jesus knows them. The sheep hears Jesus' voice and follows them. Now these two groups of people highlight two aspects of our salvation. If you are to look at verse 26 and 27 carefully, it seems to imply that 
Believe in Jesus is a matter of whether you are his sheep or whether you are not his sheep. And later on in verse 29, it says that the sheep are given to Jesus by God the Father and he knows them. Now in a certain sense, this passage is saying that from God's perspective, God has chosen his sheep. There's a doctrine associated with God making this choice, who will ultimately be saved and who will not. And uh, this doctrine is called the doctrine of predestination and unconditional election. However, I feel that this is not the main emphasis of the passage here, and I shall not dwell on it. But for further information, you can approach the most handsome people in this church. And uh, guess who it is? It is our Pastor Vincent. Okay. And then you can approach the second most handsome people in this church, and it is our Deacon Chi Hong. Okay. If you are really dying, dying out of curiosity to know what is this doctrine of uh, predestination and unconditional election, I think they will be more glad to assist you. However, what is clear from these two verses are the symptoms of true belief. For one that truly believes, there's a change of heart and there's a change of life. In this passage, it says that the true sheep hears the voice of Jesus and follow him. The one who is not a true sheep has a hardened heart. Our faith in Christ must be accompanied by listening to the voice of Jesus and following him. Belief in Jesus is active, it is not passive. True faith must always be accompanied by awareness of our old sinful ways and the desire to live holy lives. True faith in Jesus is a relationship. It's not mere knowledge or a set of religious codes or duties. And this brings us to principle 2a. <coughs> Believers of Jesus must hear his voice and follow him. Believers of Jesus must hear his voice and follow him. As we reflect upon this principle, let's think about our relationship with Jesus and with God. Or let's think about whether we have any relationship at all. Do we hear his voice? Do we have a certain sense of familiarity with him and his ways? Do we know him? Or does God seem to be someone who is very distant to you? <coughs> if so, honestly acknowledge to God that you need help. To know Jesus' voice means also to prefer His voice to all surrounding voices that rob us of peace, that cause us of anxiety, and that seeks to draw us away from Him. Listening to God's voice also means listening to His Word. And listening to His Word will increasingly bring us discernment and prevent us from being misled by false teachers. We then move on to verse 28 and 29 where Jesus says, I shall read for you, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Now, what is these two verses saying? These two verses is saying that eternal life is eternal, right? Obvious, isn't it obvious? Okay. When something is eternal, it is not temporary. To put it plainly, having eternal life means you can never lose your salvation. You can never lose your relationship with God. No one, nothing, even yourself, can snatch you out of Jesus' hand and the Father's hand. Your spiritual life with God is protected by God Himself. It is guarded by Jesus' powerful work on the cross. And as we read in the responsive reading today, uh, where our sister Gina has read out for us, nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now, doesn't this truth give you tremendous assurance that you are safe and secure in Him? As a believer, 
Jesus is continuously watching over you. Now this brings us to principle 2B. Our salvation is safe and secure in Jesus and God the Father. Again, isn't this a great assurance? Now for these two aspects of salvation to make sense, we must be aware of two truths about his identity. In verse 13, Jesus said in the clearest term possible to all his audience that he and the Father are one. Now when we say that so and so are one, we can mean a lot of things, right? We can mean one in purpose, one in mission, one in thoughts. We can say that both a husband and his wife are one in thoughts and values. In fact, you know, when the three musketeers say all for one and one for all, okay, they are referring to unity, mission and purpose. They promise to work as a team, they promise to look out for one another. But obviously, <coughs> they are three separate persons and not one person. But when Jesus said, I and the Father are one, He's saying in the clearest possible term, that he is one with God, both in essence, both in nature. Now he's using the language of the Shama found in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, where all the Jews are familiar. And in this verse it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What Jesus is saying here is that I am God Himself, the Lord your God, the Lord who is one. And the Jews understood that clearly and they began to pick up stones to stone Him for blasphemy. Now blasphemy is punishable by death in the law. Now, the Jews have every reason to do that because they only saw Jesus as human, a mere man. Verse 33 says, because you being a man, make yourself God. However, what they cannot comprehend was that Jesus is God incarnate. The God who became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This was the truth that was stated in the beginning of John chapter 1 verse 14. A truth that continues throughout the book and into this chapter. And this brings us to principle 2c. Faith in God includes believing that Jesus is God and man and one with the Father. Thus your faith encompasses this belief in His identity. To reason with them regarding how reasonable is His claim. This passage was quoted from Psalm 82. And Psalms 82 verse 6 says, You are God's sons of the Most High, all of you. Now, in verse 34 of the book of this chapter, I shall read for you, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are God's? If you call them God's, to whom the word of God, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him? whom the Father has consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I am the Son of God. Now, to understand what Jesus is trying to say here, we have to understand the background of Psalm 82. Now, Psalm 82 was written to corrupt judges in the Old Testament, and um, God was challenging them to live up to their holy vocation. The judges had not done their duty, they had been corrupt, they have not been dispensing justice to the wicked. They have been neglecting the weak and needy who have been oppressed. But even so, God used the word God or in the Hebrew language, Elohim, in the original language to describe them because they were his appointed agents to carry out his work. Now, Jesus' reasoning was this. If scripture spoke of mere men, even imperfect or simple one as God, because they were disappointed agents, why would the Jews accuse him of blasphemy as son of God? Moreover, if you were to look at Jesus' words and his work, 
they were faultless, they were beyond reproach, as compared to the work of those corrupt judges. And both were God's appointed agent to carry out his work. Now, just the other day, I was having a lunch gathering with my colleagues, and uh, we were eating Peranakan food, and uh, some of the dishes were quite spicy. As I was eating some of the food, they noticed that I was sweating and struggling. So one of them asked, you can't eat spicy food, your face is as red as the chili here. <laughs> to which I say, yes. Even though when I'm not eating spicy stuff, my face can get quite red at times for no apparent reason. I'm not sure how effective this illustration is that explains Jesus' reasoning, but Jesus was using a comparison of the extreme to make a point. If no chili my face red, what more is chili? It will be lovely red, right? If unjust men are still called gods, what about the faultless Jesus who called himself Son of God? Now, Jesus' reasoning must have made an impact for, at least for the moment, the stones had not flown in. Jesus' line of reasoning then continued further in verses 37 to 39 with a final invitation. Jesus reasoned that if they would not believe in him, they should at least believe in his works and miracles. They should have seen the fingerprints of the Father all over his acts. They should have concluded that he is in the Father and the Father is in him. Now I'd like to call this an invitation because Jesus was in effect saying, Now, if you are having a problem right now believing in me, understanding my words, accepting my identity, at least try to make sense of the deeds or the, the miracles that I have performed. My deeds bear the hallmarks of God the Father. Now, if you take a step in that direction, it might lead you into a greater understanding of who I am. This was an offer, and I believe it was the final one made in public to the Jews. The invitation was apparently rejected, because in verse 39, the Jews sought to arrest him. Now the next time that Jesus was to return to Jerusalem was on Palm Sunday, which is about three months later, and <coughs> Jesus would be arrested, he would be crucified. So it seems like it was his last public invitation <coughs> to the Jews. And this last invitation brings us to the final principle. Jesus' works and his works, as recorded in the Gospel, testify to who he is, and he invites us to examine them. For those who have yet to believe, if you are among us, Jesus freely invites you to examine his claims and his offer of salvation. Now, if you would just take that step, he is a God who will respond, he will reveal, and he will convince. Now moving to the last two verses, 40 to 41. I shall read for you. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. Many believe in him then. What a stark contrast. What a stark contrast between the Jews in Jerusalem and the people living on the other side of Jordan. And what is the key? What is the key to their belief? The key to their belief is a receptive and humble heart and to, let, to take that first step to listen. And once you have taken that first step to listen, you will have answers that will not disappoint. Will you open your hearts to him today? Shall we close in prayer? Father, we thank you that you have given us your words. Your words are meant to lead us to believe in Jesus so that we may have eternal life. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you are this powerful God who became man, that you died on the cross to redeem us, and that no one 
Nothing can snatch us out from your hand. Strengthen us by your Holy Spirit.